Hello friends and welcome to a very special episode of Robin's Nest, where we celebrate the heart of humanity and the power of compassion in action. I'm Dr. Robin Gansard and today we're doing something a little different and incredibly exciting. In this episode, we're bringing you a fascinating conversation with one of the world's leading scientific visionaries, Dr. George Church, a pioneer in genetics, biotechnology, and conservation innovation. Dr. Church's work explores how science can not only protect endangered species, but may one day help restore those we've all lost, all while raising profound questions about ethics, ecology, and the future of our planet. I won't be conducting today's interview myself, but our team had the extraordinary opportunity to sit down with Dr. Church for an in-depth discussion about how breakthroughs in science and compassion can work together to safeguard life on Earth. So sit back, open your mind, and prepare to be inspired by the future of conservation right here on Robin's Nest. Welcome to Robin's Nest. Many of us feel a deep bond with animals, from the pets we cherish at home to the endangered species in nature. Join us for lively, informative conversations where together we will build a more humane world. I'm George Church, professor of genetics at Harvard Medical School, and I work on various technologies for uh, medicine and for conservation. We are interested in uh, virus resistance for plants, animals, and people. We've uh, demonstrated complete virus resistance in, in a bacterium. We have uh, some new, new vaccines for wild animals, and we participate in vaccines for humans that involve uh, either infectious diseases or cancers. My passions for things related to uh, animal health started in, when I grew up in Florida. I was surrounded by diverse uh, animal species. Um, snakes and wild cats and uh, all sorts of interesting things on the mud flats that I lived on. A and then I did my undergraduate degree in one of them in zoology um, and that uh, increased it some more. Um, had a kind of a long-term interest in, in large herbivores, uh, especially ancient extinct ones. And so these all came together in terms of uh, conservation and and increasing diversity from ancient DNA. I think uh, people are very accepting of medically oriented genetic engineering. For example, uh, bacteria that make insulin in, in big fermenters. Uh, that's very distant relations. They get more sensitive when it's about plants and food that they're gonna be giving to their kids. Makes perfect sense. And then they get, then they get open-minded again when it refers to improving the um, environment for animals for climate change and sort of like that. They're much more open-minded about that. So when I started thinking about uh, bringing back ancient DNA for, say, diversity of modern species, there were several criteria that I considered. I considered many different species. One was uh, endangered species first, so something that could benefit endangered species, something that could prevent, benefit our habitats, our environment, something that could um, Potentially, I mean, it just, we don't have to promise these things, we just have to consider them as a, as a reason for working um, uh, climate change. And finally, something that was charismatic and not some invasive species uh, intrinsically. And so, uh, so the mammoth really had it all, and it still is, I think, way ahead of number two in my book. Uh, it is very charismatic, people love it. Uh, it is, uh, you know, large enough that it can kind of take care of itself a bit. Uh, social animal, so we have to be particularly concerned with its humane treatment. Um, and it has this habitat that it used to, its relatives used to have in, in the Arctic, where in the Arctic is a place where most of the world's carbon is sequestered and it's very easy to sequester because of the cold cycles. Um, so anyway, just it's an endangered species that needs um, new land to live in and uh, it has, uh, it needs uh, help with viruses. It just was just, the whole package was very attractive as a, both as a challenge and as a, a potential benefit to, for humans. So when we talk about some species uh, th that their, their only habitat is now completely urbanized, um, that's not the case for the, for woolly mammoths and, or, or a, a cold tolerant version of uh, the endangered um, elephants. Um, it's, a, it's, an, it's, it's, a, it's an ideal environment in terms of 
minimal conflict with humans. Where elephants are right now, they're in conflict over ivory from their tusks and also for trampling farmland. But in the Arctic, the human population density is very close to zero in, in wide stretches of the Arctic, which is about 19 million square kilometers. So it's, it's a vast environment um, where they would not be near humans, much less in conflict with them. When we think about climate change, it's important to think about how people influence it. And that's about 10 gigatons of carbon per year. Uh, and we could also think about habitats that sequester carbon. Uh, and um, of all the habitats in the world, the one that has the most sequestered carbon, as far as I know, is the Arctic. It has up to 500 meters of, of, of carbon-rich soil, as opposed to one meter in rainforests. And that's because each year you build up a frozen layer. 1,400 gigatons in the Arctic, 10 gigatons per year that are human. Obviously, you want to preserve the 1,400. and sequester more, add, keep adding on to the place that already has a lot. Uh, now elephants role in this is it used to be a lot of herbivores in the Arctic that would keep uh, grasslands rich, so full of species. Herbivores were killed off, including mammoths, probably humans contributed significantly to that. The Arctic uh, became more trees, trees allow the snow to stay fluffy and insulate the summer warmth away from the minus 40 degree wind, and that's not good for um, pr preserving the uh, sequestered carbon. And, uh, and if you could bring back those herbivores, which would certainly happen if it were grasslands, uh, and mammoths, or sorry, elephants, or species in general are the only ones that, only mammals, that uh, like to knock down trees. They love knocking down trees, both to get at the vegetation at the top and also to just, um, they like doing it. Uh, so anyway, that, that's an argument for exploring this. It's not necessarily a guarantee or anything like that. In fact, there's very few solutions for the carbon in the air um, that are perfect by themselves. So this is just one possible solution that we can explore. We're also, we're not trying to make a particular kind of, you know, a particular DNA sequence. We're trying to make something that's well adapted and is, and is particularly happy with its environment, whatever that is. And so we can adjust it um, and particularly want to get, um, remove temptation of poachers um, by, you know, manipulation of the tusks. Uh, and we'd also like to um, get, get, get them away from a level of uh, herpes virus infection which is almost extinction level all by itself, even without help from uh, humans. Uh, so we'd like to solve those two problems, which doesn't mean going back uh, in time necessarily, but, but we also do want to go back in time for the cold resistance. And so it's a combination of modern, ancient, and new things. In the theme of, uh, uh, you know, of this as being a potential way uh, that we want to accelerate it to, to keep pace with the accelerating uh, climate change, and that would mean scaling up um, the reproduction of the elephants. There's, we're probably going to be stuck with a 22-month gestation period, but we aren't stuck with the one elephant calf per gestation period, and that we're not stuck with the current herd. So we can probably scale that up with uh, exodev or um, ectogenesis, as it's sometimes called, of, of birth outside of the body. Um, that can be scaled up uh, without interfering with the reproductive cycles of the endangered species. That's very important for us that we don't bother them to get eggs or to um, deliver experimental calves. All elephants are endangered species and any one of them could be made more to cold tolerant so they would have a home in the Arctic where they could reproduce. But first we want to have lots of them, um, partly because they're endangered already and the nice to restore. These will all be interbreedable with current uh, endangered elephants will be increasing their diversity by reaching back in space and in time to uh, find um, you know, a way for them to be uh, happy, and, and, but, but also have a large number of them at once. And so that, that would be a, um, the goal. We at Colossal have a relationship with the American Humane Society. This is very important uh, to us. We're very grateful. Um, part of what we're trying to do is every time we, we uh, take a, a step t forward in terms of conservation, 
human goals like climate change, um, human, uh, goals having to do with um, resuscitation, rewilding, and so forth, we'd like to have as many partners and, and insight into what, uh, what, what we think could go wrong and how we mitigate that in advance before we get too far along in it. In the face of increasing biodiversity loss, there still is hope uh, uh, in that I think we're getting more efficient at our um, utilization of land for providing food for humans. Um, it, could, it could easily compress farms by tenfold over some long period of time. Uh, we could uh, also, I think we're getting much better at managing habitats, bringing back keystone species, rewilding them to enrich those habitats so that the number of species that, that can in, uh, maintain in the same space can go up. Um, I think uh, education, like this conversation we're having here, uh, is, is great hope for the future. So which career achievement I'm most proud of? I think it's the training of hundreds of uh, students and postdocs, people that have come through the lab. Um, I guess second to that would be our ability to read and write DNA uh, and edit it efficiently, which is kind of a, it's a collection of things. Even in the face of all the you know, e exciting things that we do, uh, there, are, there are surprises day to day that um, I don't need to keep me going. I'm, I'm uh, highly motivated. But just when you see um, a patient that's received a kidney that's been genetically engineered, uh, you know, the first time in years having a vibrant and, ex and uh, excitement about life, uh, these off-kidney dialysis that Tim Andrews, for example, um, it just, it's just so heartwarming and, and, uh, and even double my already high <laughs> motivation. Uh, same thing goes in, in for, for, for animals when you see an endangered species suddenly get a boost in diversity or in numbers. Um, it's, it's, uh, it, it gives us hope for the future. So if I, if I had one thing to say to the next generation of uh, uh, people leaning towards conservation, it is uh, and, and in the face of a AI and, and, uh, and uh, all this biotechnology, it is that it's your opportunity and maybe responsibility to harness these new tools like AI and biotechnology for good, whatever you consider, and whatever your peers consider the, that's good for uh, humanity and for the other species. Really, thank you for having me and thank you for providing this for the world. What an incredible journey through the world of genetics and conservation with Dr. George Church. A reminder that the future of our planet depends not just on technology, but on empathy and moral courage. Here at Robin's Nest and through our work at American Humane Society, we believe that innovation and compassion must always walk hand in hand. Together they form the path to a kinder, more sustainable world for all living beings. If today's conversation moved you, please share this episode with someone who cares about animals, the planet, and the promise of a better tomorrow. And don't forget to subscribe to Robin's Nest wherever you listen to podcasts so you never miss a story of hope, heart, and humanity. I'm Dr. Robin Ganser. Thank you for joining me here in the nest where compassion takes flight.